die Frage ist, was ist wichtiger? Das Schlafen oder wach sein? Oder das wach sein oder schlafen? Everyone who, who knows Alex is struck on the one hand by his intelligence, uh, that he doesn't put up to show, that he's very thoughtful before he makes a comment, that he is modest. But behind that modesty, there is uh, a, a curiosity and also a certain ambition to find out something more. I mean, he's a real scientist and he knows the importance of giving support and independence to young researchers at the beginning of their career. So he's, he's used his power to make things change. He's a very good listener, so he's, I observed him yesterday, he's listening to people all the time, he nods, he doesn't say much, and then suddenly when he is really convinced that uh, his partner in the conversation finished what he wanted to say, then there is suddenly a very brilliant question that uh, opens your eyes and uh, yeah, uh, makes you think of other dimensions to the problem. His passion for reading, for just listening, for absorbing a lot of data, and not very often to sharing his uh, thought, actually, but just listening to you and trying to learn as much as, as possible. And so we were trying, Julie and I were trying to uh, get him a little bit off guard, for instance, pushing him to come with us uh, in the desert. And we did so, and Alex, of course, very politely, always accepted our uh, invitations. Uh, but I think he was a little bit scared by the, the trips in, in, in the desert. And maybe because of that, after that invi invitation, he never accepted <laughs> to come back with us uh, in the desert or, or anywhere else until Irene also came with him. And then it was okay. I think the prägendste an him is his große wissenschaftliche Ernsthaftigkeit und jetzt gar nicht negativ, sondern eher positiv gemeint, seine Rigidität. Er biegt sich nicht nach irgendwelchen Winden, nach irgendwelchen Strömungen, sondern er, er, verfolgt, er verfolgt seine Ideen äh, und bleibt sich in diesen Dingen immer treu. Und daran, dadurch war er natürlich für viele auch immer eine wichtige Orientierungsfigur. So, when I started to do sleep research, I read papers by Alex and I thought that that's what I should do. I, I think that was one of Alex's um, strengths, that he attracted people from different fields. So there was an interaction between biologists, ph physicists, and, and that was uh, a very fascinating aspect. Er hat ja auch die, das Translationelle äh, sehr stark gelebt und gezeigt, also die Fähigkeit aus verschiedenen äh, Perspektiven, Schlafforschung zu betreiben beim Tier, in vitro, beim Menschen, beim kranken Menschen. As I think about it, he would intentionally invite all kinds of different people with all kinds of different uh, approaches to this area, this common area, and um, would really uh, encourage everyone to bring out their ideas and bring out the disagreements. 
and uh, to try to see if there were some common ground. This is sort of unusual in, in, in a period where there were a lot of kind of dog and pony shows where, where uh, people would come and kind of uh, propagate their particular uh, tribe's uh, agenda. Und so richtig wichtig für uns wurde, ist er, äh, wo wir selber, wo ich dann selber in Bern ein Schlaflabor ähm, auf beigestellt habe, wo natürlich er schon ein Mentor war im Hintergrund, der uns unterstützt hat. In his clarity of thinking, of arguing, in his, but in particular also in, with his friendliness and with his modesty in which he approached these things. He was clearly not in a league with, with many of the modern scientists um, where the, the business has become so competitive. And he was always uh, interested simply in, the, in understanding what, um, how the system worked rather than in promoting his own career. Alex Borbe has had a tremendous influence on uh, the research that I've been doing for my, seems like my entire career. He, uh, his ideas and suggestions uh, and his gentle manner with which he introduced uh, revolutionary new concepts were, were quite uh, refreshing and delightful. There would have been possibly no sleep research at the University of Surrey if I hadn't met Alex in 1977. Alex was the sleep expert. I knew nothing about sleep, but I knew that I wanted to work on sleep. And so he taught me how to do it. I'm coming here to honor that very I think important theory that's really made a difference in the field and brought the circadian biologist and the sleep people together. It's extraordinary what's happened from a simple sketch to the development with Sergi Dan and Domine Biesma of a mathematical model which predicted experiments. And the thing was, it said, if you take a little nap in the afternoon, your sleep pressure will go down and you'll take longer to fall asleep and you'll have less deep sleep in the evening. So off they go to the lab and they do that experiment and it does that. And, and one of the ways that, that the two-process model has really changed sleep research is because it has allowed people to go out and try to test hypotheses based on the predictions of the model. And if you didn't have a model um, that would make a prediction about what would happen, then it would just be an observation and you've, now you've discovered what it's like and that's that, end of story. But now the two process model comes along and predicts the sleep structure dead on, but not the waking performance. And now all of a sudden the experimental data are much more interesting because you have a clear prediction, something that, that sounds, once the two process model uh, was established, sounds quite logical. And sure enough, the, the sleep data follow that model, but the wake data do not. And now, all of a sudden, nature is trying to tell you something. Nature is trying to tell you that, that you've got part of the puzzle right, but you're missing another piece. And it gives you something to, to start looking for. And I think that, when, when a model does that, first of all, that makes it, then that means that it's a model that's doing its work right. Um, and, and secondly, it makes research so much more interesting. So you could do beautiful experiments, and in those days, everyone was doing experiments all the time and tightening up the, the model, changing the, the parameters. There's an enormous number of hypotheses that have been generated by the two process model because you have these two things that you can fiddle around with and you can produce almost any type of, of uh, prediction based on, on uh, uh, the relations of these parameters. It means that you can, uh, well, the number of experiments you can make and then test them against the model, it's, uh, it's uh, infinite. To the extent that we can mathematically instantiate a correct prediction of wakefulness using the two-process model, I believe the models will profoundly change the world. They will come to be used by virtually every major component of society. Uh, and by that I mean from by regulated industries regarding work hour rules, by uh, the military potentially, by uh, predicting um, 
when people should use countermeasures, say in spaceflight or wherever. Sometimes there were doubts. Is, is the model really holding up? And can we really continue to defend the model? And, and, and there were several instances that, that people were doubtful. Is there a recurrence of slow wave sleep during very long sleep episodes? And then how can we show that the model can explain it? And in general, we always said, oh no, we can explain it with the model. We can, we can simulate it and, and everything was just uh, very fine. We discovered that the two process model is still incredibly potent at predicting waking performance and cognition in a total sleep deprivation paradigm. It, it's very, very good. You can say a great deal with it. However, it had a great deal of trouble as soon as we got into a chronic condition of partial sleep loss or something. On the other hand, this is the good news, bad news, good news. The good news was it looked like only an adjustment of a time constant of the, of the buildup of the homeostatic drive could take care of that chronic error. It's also a very good tool for uh, teaching people how they function. When uh, you can show an active live model how it works, you can actually tell people who don't really understand this that uh, if you get up early, this is what's, what's going to happen. If you uh, push your sleep, this is what's going to happen. You can use it to teach uh, kids. Das zwei prozess model für mich selber hat mir zeigt, dass man auch komplexe biologische Phänomene kann reduzieren kann auf relativ nicht einfache, aber doch klare, mathematisch ausdrückbare Phänomene. It's just that the graphical representation, the graphical representation of how an oscillating variable can influence another oscillating variable is so easy to understand that you just uh, on a tablecloth can draw uh, what happens uh, under sleep deprivation conditions, for instance. You can imagine what the outcome of certain experiments will be without having to do a mathematical exercise. Uh, and uh, pre prior to Alex coming along, uh, the, the models which were produced uh, and to explain this interaction were totally unintelligible to me, uh, very mathematical, involving lots of formulae, uh, which most people had never understood. But Alex came up with a conceptual model uh, and involves a picture. Uh, and uh, people can understand pictures and figures uh, far more than uh, lots of words and numbers. So he's actually, his, his diagrams and illustrations are, are the most salient thing, I think. Uh, it makes everybody, even students, can understand what it's all about. And the simplicity is important because it helps us structure our thoughts. And of course, it also generates limitations, like any model and any concept will, because we tend to think along the lines of the two process model and therefore we neglect other aspects. We, and and uh, yeah, so that's, it's important to look at it from different sides. But, but I think now uh, we have had uh, 25 years with many experiments that uh, have uh, increased our insight in the influence of the circadian system in alertness regulation, in sleep regulation, and that is very important. The model was sort of testable and one of the tests that Alex had performed already was to subject the animals to sleep deprivation, the rats at that point. He was working with 24 hours sleep deprivation or 12 hours, already playing with the circadian aspect. And that of course initiated the possibility to test in other species this homeostatic aspect. And that is true, that, that triggered a lot of research. The model is still there, it's still being used to try and explain changes in depression. Uh, and I think it's been extraordinarily helpful in ordering one's ideas and ordering one's concepts. The Mathematik, die er in die Schlafforschung und die Schlafmedizin gebracht hat, die Fähigkeit, die Möglichkeit, die Schlaftiefe zu messen, ist natürlich auch für uns in der Schlafmedizin sehr wichtig. Alex has provided the sleep field with a common language. And, and we didn't have that common language before the two-process model um, was there. We didn't know how to talk about sleep-dependent versus circadian stuff. Uh, but then all of a sudden we said, okay, well, is it process S or is it process C? It's a terrific time to, to be in the area. The two-process model will, will continue. I'm absolutely convinced it will continue to manifest now in the neurobiology in the mathematical modeling and in the cognitive area. And so, if anything, what's happened is it has 
it has it exploded out to have a penetrating effect, I think, in a variety of areas, and it's only going to get more interesting. I started uh, in Alex's lab in 1987 and I did the first studies in the new labs at the Gloria Straße <laughs> together with Dirk and Dijk. And he just recently says, or he usually says, you know, <laughs> the good old days at the Gloria Straße <laughs> where we had this uh, you know, lab with the bedrooms just beside our uh, rec recording rooms. We implanted the mice and the other rats that back then on our desk. <laughs> and the recording rooms were in our office. We had to be very silent when the animals had to recover from the sleep deprivation. <laughs> don't, it, don't, we were tap allowed to, don't tap too hard on your computer. <laughs> and we usually spend the night there, sleeping beside the polygraph and uh, listening to the noise of the polygraph and then in the morning you were very tired because you had to uh, take care of the subjects in the morning and then uh, you had to make sure that you made it up to the 10 o'clock break, coffee break. It is 10 o'clock <laughs> <laughs> coffee break where we all had to be there. Somehow the group was synchronized every morning at 10 o'clock all the new stuff of the day was sort of transmitted over the group. But that's had... a good thing, no? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good thing. thing. No, 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 no that's, that's a good thing. You learned, I, I think I learned how to run, how you can run a group. And then we could start up writing a paper. And then that's when uh, Alex uh, really came in and told us uh, how to write a paper. His English was really good and uh, I've learned English also by all these international students he had in his lab. I think Alex is really a cosmopolitan, he's really an international person. And um, Tom said, I think Alex is very Swiss. <laughs> and I think he, he has these, both these qualities. He's on one hand very open, very international, inviting, but at the same time, I think it's true, he's, uh, he's Swiss. I agree with, with Daniel that uh, what, what I always uh, want, or Alex, he was very open also for, not only for people, but also for, for new technical developments. I can still remember the study we did with this spoon, <laughs> the spoon study, uh, <laughs> so you had to, you had to put it under your tongue, and it, it was emitting a low electrical field, and it should it was supposed to help you, you know, to initiate sleep. He was not a typical MD in my way because MDs would say, okay, you are a patient, you take this drug, it's like this. So he was very skeptical from the beginning. Even when he looked at your results, he was like, okay, and what? So it was always, uh, you didn't know what is he, what is he thinking of, of, of your data. And then you said, do you think it's, it's okay? You said, yes, yes, but you know. So it's, it was, he's very skeptical, very critical. And I think that's uh, an attitude which has been transposed to his PhD students or most of them, I think. I think I, I learned a lot about uh, writing science. The skeptical attitude I think that's, yeah, that Alex still has that. I mean, Alex has that attitude and I think I, I learned that from him as well. 
the skills you learn is analyzing data. I think that's, that's, that's key when you come from the, the Zurich lab. Many things I learned during my PhD, I still use also in uh, clinical sleep medicine now, nowadays. I had the skills to actually do the analysis and, and, and I think that what helped me a lot um, during my career. And all what I had learned from uh, during my PhD uh, at this lab uh, helped me afterwards to actually, yeah, to critically look at data uh, and to become also a more independent uh, researcher. It's perfectly ridiculous to say that Alex has been an inspiration for us all and especially for our work. It's also perfectly ridiculous to say that uh, you know there are many great scientists and some of them are lucky and they may even get, uh, provide some great contribution to science but very few in my experience have created a school have succeeded in creating a school and Alex has created a school which is extraordinary it's international it's enormously flourishing as we can see now and I think we are all proud to be part of that school and that I think in science is one of the greatest compliments one can make for a real master which Alex is. Once you gave me a, a book many years ago, a brief history uh, of time. I've gone back in the alphabet to give you a book uh, by the other great uh, thinker, kind of a god, Richard Dawkins. And he talks about the god delusion, how there can be entire communities <laughs> who believe in something, <laughs> no longer question it. And this leads to many, many problems because they become fanatics. So I thank you very much for reminding us that we should not become fanatics, but base our ideas and knowledge on facts and experiments. Thank you very much, Alex, for everything. I have to say that after your speech this afternoon, I first decided not to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> it may be a little bit too simple, but I thought I would like to give you a 25-year-old spirit. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for inspiring us. And that was called it's heavy spirit, so you have to dilute it. And I thought this also applies to the two process models, so everybody can take of it what applies to this kind of research, this kind of applications, and so I wanted to give this to you. It's a medieval cosmological picture with the man who's sleeping and dreaming, and, and he's inside the crystalline sphere, but his head is poking outside. Somehow the dreaming, you're you've escaped the sublunary world. And so I think if you, if you really want to pop out of that bubble, you should leave part of yourself inside so that uh, all of us who, who've, who've come to know you in that bubble uh, continue to, to, to uh, that you don't abandon us and that we continue to know you over the years. So uh, hope you'll remember that. <laughs> This is Alex in the desert. Uh, I still, to this day, Julian and I, we could not figure out what Alex was looking at, what he was looking or searching for in the desert. We don't know. But uh, I just want to tell you that we won't give up. So next year, we haven't decided about the desert, which kind of desert. <laughs> but certainly, we'll ask you again to join us. That will be wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> I actually enjoyed every one of them, <laughs> but I often smile inside. <laughs> so that's one of my problems. That I okay, I believe you. <laughs> I thought, well, you're going to need to relax to be inspired after this meeting. Uh, and then I thought about synapses and strengthening synapses or weakening synapses. <laughs> And then I thought, perhaps you needed a foretaste of Glasgow for the ESRS. Wow. So here's a foretaste of Glasgow. Oh. <laughs>